I want to call to order the regularly scheduled meeting of the Murfreesboro Unit District Board of Education. And just for the record and for everybody that's here and watching, two of the board members, Mrs. Brazel and Mr. Bain, are joining us via Zoom. Uh, Google, I'm sorry. So, Mrs. Hines, will you uh, call the roll, please? Mr. Bain. He's here. He's here. Okay. Mr. Beavers. Here. Mrs. Brazel. Yes. Mr. Green. Yes. Mr. Brown. Yes. Mrs. Evaldi. <coughs> here. Mrs. Erwazi. Mrs. Mrs. <laughs> <laughs> one, one of us is here. The next item is Pledge of Allegiance. Mr. Brown, will you please lead us? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Item number four is the approval of the agenda. We do have one amendment to the agenda at least. Item number seven under new business will be eliminated for tonight. And Dr. Evers, are there any other amendments or changes? Just um, one FOIA item. We had one. I mean, it's listed on there, but we didn't have anything specific that had been Okay. I'll entertain a motion to approve the agenda as amended. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Item number five is the approval of the consent agenda, which consists of District 186 regular board meeting minutes dated December the 21st, 2021, Tri-County regular board meeting minutes dated December the 8th, 2021, Tri-County special board meeting minutes dated December 14th, 2021, Tri-County bills for January 2022, Applications and reports, and I'll entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. Second. Second. Miss. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Item number six is the approval of District 186 bills for January of 2022. And I'll open the floor to any questions from the board to Mrs. Hyde, or Mrs. Bush. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> or you can answer. Or, or, yeah, Terry can answer. <laughs> Are there any questions from the board? Then I'll entertain a motion to approve the District 186 bills. So, in a second. Okay. Mrs. Hines? Mr. Green? Yes. Mr. Beavers? Yes. Mrs. Brassel? Yes. Mr. Brown? Yes. Mrs. Evaldi? Yes. Mr. Bain? Yes. Mr. Rundy? Yes, motion carries. Item number seven is communications. I think we have some. We do. We have four. So the first one is from Emily Collier. Dear Dr. Evers and the Board of Education, I am applying for my master's in elementary education from Mississippi College. I plan to start this journey in the spring of 2022. My hope and purpose for achieving this degree is that it will help me with my current role as a first grade element elementary teacher at General John A. Logan. My long-term goal with this degree is to learn new information that will help make me a better ed educator. I hope to be able to help my team and lead them with my knowledge. Being a first grade teacher, I see students' struggles daily with reading. I hope to learn ways to help improve our students' literacy and reading fluency. I feel that I am at a stable place in my life and teaching career. I am ready to take this challenge full-heartedly. I am asking for a step increase in my pay after my completion. <coughs> the anticipated graduation date is fall of 2022. Sincerely, Emily Collier. And I'll entertain a motion to approve that continuing education for her. So moved. Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Okay, the second one is regarding Kathy Rogers, written by Georgia Marshall. Um, on Thursday, January the 6th at 7.30 a.m., Denise Ferris told me at approximately 2.10 p.m. that Kathy Rogers had called to inform me Denise had called to inform Denise that she was quitting. I called Kathy at 2.20 and she told me the same. I then asked her to put this in writing, including today's date and the statement that she quit. I told her it could be in email or text. As of now, I have no statement. But she's been no comment. No action to take on that. No, we're, we're, making action, we're making action to to close session. Yeah. Would that come in closed session? Yeah, I think we probably should act on it in closed session yeah. as a, as a okay. no call no show resignation. Okay, the next one's from Morgan 
Smith. Good afternoon. I would like to resign as cheer coach effective immediately. I have enjoyed my last three and a half years as cheer coach and love the girls beyond belief. However, with labor coming up quickly, I do not have the time and I am unsure of when I will be able to attend games and practices. Michelle Blevins has agreed to take over responsibility as head coach for the remainder of this season. I truly apologize for such short notice, but Michelle and I have discussed this and we believe it is in the best interest of the girls. Loyally, Ms. Morgan Smith. I'll entertain a motion to accept that resignation. Is that for the middle school or high school? Middle, middle school. school. So moved. And a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, motion carries. The last one is from Virginia Griffin. Dr. Evers and Mr. Todd, first I want to start off by explaining this is the most difficult document I have ever drafted. When I moved my daughter and myself to Illinois, it was under the circumstances that my husband would be transferring, transferring soon. The military has since changed that plan and my husband is no longer transferable due to a required promotion slash transfer to a different location in Arkansas. With that being said, please accept this as my letter of resignation. My last day will be January the 21st, 2022. <coughs> Thank you for everything. I understand the repercussions of this decision, but it is in the best decision for my family. Respectfully, Virginia Griffin. I'll entertain a motion to accept that resignation. I, I, I truly believe that she thought she would that this transfer would come through, and it just did not. So yes. she's done a great job in the three months that we've had her. I hate to see her go, but we have beyond that her milita control. Yeah, military is yep. totally always beyond our control. So, so moved. Second. Second. All in favor. I oppose motion carries. Is anyone else warm in here? A little bit. I only saw one head shaking all and heard some yeses. Oh, 70. It's 70. 70. I, oh, I, 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 started, it up, I started up from 67 last week. Sorry. All right, next item is uh, fishbowl items, and I think we have one. I'm not sure who's got it. I do. Uh, General John A. Logan Attendance Center would like to thank. PTO and honors Christine DeShazo for our beautiful new, new mural. The painting of our namesake is inside the front doors in the main hallway at General. Thanks to all involved. I'm going to stick to your own This is one of those talented muralists I've ever, ever, you know, been able to view. And we're so, so fortunate that she, her art is shown in our school, two of our schools now. Your, uh, did she do your mural? Yeah. She's, She's done, done another one at our, <laughs> two more at our school. Third, third one. This is a, so, so, talented. so talented. Yeah. And just glad to get it back or get something back up there where it used to be. <laughs> Me too. Yeah. So we are so so fortunate. Yeah. Well, okay. Item number nine is Freedom of Information Act request. There was one from Al Mudlock from Student Transportation of America, and the information was provided in a timely fashion. Next so, item is. Sorry, and J Jan also did one from the Illinois Retired Teachers Association, so she provided oh. that today. So. Okay. I just got it at four o'clock, so it's done. Uh, oh. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Next item is the recognition of the audience. The Board of Education welcomes the audience to make public or employee comments. The board has set aside time in the agenda specifically for this purpose. Pursuant to board policy 2.230. Each speaker shall be limited to a five minute presentation. Please be aware that while this is the time for the public to express its opinions and or concerns, the board may or may not comment regarding public presentations. If a matter of public comment warrants discussion or action of the Board of Education, such discussion or action will be added to the agenda of a future meeting. Are there any public concerns or comments? Are there any employee concerns or comments? All right, thank you all. We'll move into old business. The first item under old business is the approval of the 2021-2022 seniority list. This has been posted and on display, and I will entertain a motion to approve as presented. So moved. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Opposed? Motion carries. Item number two is the approval of the press policy updates, number 108. Again, these have been on display and they were presented at the December, December meeting. I will entertain a motion to approve the <coughs> press policy updates. Is there anything in there that we need to be concerned with? 
nothing was extremely noteworthy on these. I think it's pretty status quo. I did read them. No, Terry. I thought Terry was supposed to read it before we did. <laughs> I was going to say, they're on my desk, so please don't ask for specific. But um, no, there's there's nothing that really is Excuse me. out of the, the normal scope. So. Would you like to approve, to make the motion to approve? I make the motion to approve. And second. I'll tell you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, opposed, motion carries. We'll new, now move into new business. The first item under new business is the effect of COVID on student achievement, which is enclosure number one. And I believe we have a presentation from each of the building principals. So why don't we start? It should be noted that um, Mr. Todd will also be pre presenting Mr. Hernan's um, slideshow. He had to do uh, game supervisor supervision tonight. Um, it was kind of a last minute change. So um, he's there at middle school doing supervision and so Mr. Todd is going to do uh, Carruthers as well as the middle school. So. Okay, very good. Thank you. I forgot to say that. Uh, Mrs. Finke, why don't we start K through 12? K through 2. All right. I have one extra page because I've been thinking about this a lot and came up with something else I probably should have included so we can talk about that one last. See what I was not a what I want you to think about? What's that? Do I just nod at you what I want you to sure. do? Okay. All right, first I thought I should kind of explain how we test. Um, K2 is not tested by the state. Um, testing doesn't start by the state until they get to Carruthers and then it's every building. So for us, the testing we currently use is called Ames Web. That may be changing in the next year, but for right now, um, we benchmark with Ames Web three times a year. We do a fall assessment, a winter assessment, and a spring assessment. And then the kids are given a ranking. They're either tier one, two, or three. So you start out and tell it like this is a fall test, and you can see like tier one is very small. By the winter test, it's grown. Your goal is at the end, like teachers get really excited to bring you their individual triangle because it shows that their class is kind of flipped, right? That they started out with a lot of red and they end with a lot of green. So these next three slides are just where we are this year. Um, to be honest, we started a whole lot lower. Like these are given in percentages. So 20% of our kids were green at the beginning. That's um, equivalent kind of to what they're going to talk about as meeting and exceeding. So only 20% of our kids were where we wanted them to be at the beginning. Now after our winter benchmark, they're already up to 43. Um, that's in literacy. And we, I should say too, we test reading and math. That's, that's what we need to do. So at the early ages, they call it early literacy instead of reading early numeracy instead of math but basically you can see we started out with only 20 in um, literacy and then you come over here and only 30 in numeracy typically those numbers are quite a bit higher so that's unfortunate um, we'll get to that in a second you can kind of see a trend okay next one so first grade very similar 18 percent has gone up to 31 28% has gone up to 54 so they made a huge leap in math in first grade this year. Next one. Second grade um, started out higher, 33, and has jumped to 46 in literacy, and then 33 jumped up to 47. Now, what you tend to see from this point, you see a huge growth. Next one. This is the last year that we had complete data on. This is a complete cycle. So you've got your fall, your winter, and your spring. This is a pretty good triangle. You've gone from only 36% of your kids to 68 by the end. So that's what you want to see. Um, unfortunately, this huge amount of growth we have no record of for the COVID shutdown year. Um, next one. But every other year we have data for it and can show you this is kind of where they ended every year. So this year, um, I'm really, really curious how these kids are doing. This kindergarten class was amazing, right? They were 95% on their reading or literacy score. Um, but you can see this was their end score previously. This is where we are now and where we're projected to be. Last year we were down like 10 to 15% across the board. We had a huge loss last year and it's no surprise, right? We shut down in March, so those kids lost a quarter of their school year. Then last year, at best, they had 80% of their school year, right? Because we weren't in school on Mondays in person. 
and then we also had a couple pauses or shutdowns. So last year was a little sluggish. This year we're looking to make some improvement. If things go the way they should, kindergarten should finish up somewhere between 56 and 73 for their reading, 59 and 76 for math. First grade's a little lower. They're gonna be 44 to 64 or 67 to 84. And then second grade, 59 to 76 in reading, 60 to 77 in math. Um, one thing I wanted to look at, and that's this paper I gave you, because this, you're kind of comparing apples and oranges here, right? Like, I'm telling you how this year did in kindergarten and how the next year did in kindergarten, but those are two different groups of kids. So what I wanted to see in what's on this paper is to follow one group of kids. So this year's second graders, so this year Kendall Ellemeyer, you know, comes to mind. This is her class, kindergarten, first grade, second grade. So if you look at the triangles, you'll see this first year, they were really good. Last year you see a drop off. This year we're already doing better. So I think if anything, what it demonstrates is at least at our age group, our kids need teachers. They, they need that one-on-one. -on -one. Um, the next page tells you some interventions we do, and they're really, really effective, but most of them are only effective in person. Um, so we do have summer school to fill in the gaps. We'll probably have more kids in summer school next year. Um, we do leveled reading groups. So you take like the, the second grade, they're divided into seven different reading groups based on ability. And each of those kids goes to a specific room with a different teacher than their own usually. And they're taught at their own level. The highest kids are reading extended books, chapter books, doing projects. The lowest kids, unfortunately, are still learning letter sounds. But everybody's kind of taught at their level. And that doesn't happen when we send them home, of course. Um, we do one-on-one -on -one targeted interventions in the hallways, whether it's flashcards or digital interventions. We also do weekly progress monitoring of our low kids, which is pretty amazing. Every week they either test in reading or in math. And we, and we have a chart of every kid and how they're growing in their phonemic awareness and their fluency. Um, and then we have lots and lots of different interventions, some online, some in, per, um, in person. But we thank you for all of them because they all cost money. <laughs> but they all are very effective in reaching our kids at their own level. And that's all I have for Jenna. Do you have any questions? Do you, are you already doing the leveled reading groups? Yes. Okay. And they start, the, they do them in every grade. They start um, really close to the beginning of the year in first and second. They usually don't start in kindergarten until after Apple Festival. Okay. How much retention do we have as far as keeping the kids in the same grade for the next year? Do we keep data on that? We don't. Um, I'm sure we could get it for you. Um, kindergarten, unfortunately, where a lot of them probably should be retained, and I just say that because in the last couple of years, a lot of kids haven't gone to preschool. So they're coming in really, really, really low. And a lot of kids don't have a good foundation for first grade. We can't retain. Kindergarten is not required in the state of Illinois. So we can recommend retention, but if the parent says no, we have to let them move on. Well, then I guess that goes to the second question, because you're going to have summer school. Yes. Is that a requirement for first and second grade? It's not a requirement. Um, so, so I guess then the question would be, if those parents, you're, let's say your staff recommends these kids come to summer school and the parents don't, are we retaining them or what are we doing? Or what we will can, we do? We can do that for okay. first and second grade. Absolutely. We can make that kind of conditional. They need to come. They need to show growth. They, and what we don't present it as a punishment. We present it as like your child isn't where their peers are and we can catch them up in the summer. But if you just try to bump them right ahead, they're always going to be behind. They're never going to catch up. Like, they're going to have to do extra time. And I think it is a help. I think we've gone a long way, like, with transportation and food and things like that. So it makes it something accessible to all our kids. I wish, kind of, we had a tutoring program that would do that. But that's, I mean, that's dicey, too, because at our age, we would get used for babysitting instead of actually interventions that the kids need. One of the things that I find really heartwarming is that your paraprofessionals are out in the hallway doing interventions prior to the first bell ringing. As soon as your little people are done eating, they're doing many of those reading interventions or the fluency checks with children out in the hallway with that little divided screen prior to 8.15. I mean, if a kid is done and they come, they are, they're working with those students. So our paraprofessional utilization is outstanding. 
and making sure that they have those weekly <clears throat> progress monitoring data points so that they understand that that is meaningful and that it's not just aggregate data that those individual chi child measures are important so I really do love seeing that because the kids just know it's just part of their routine they'll go they'll sit with the paraprofessional they'll do their reading fluency check and they know what it's called they'll say hi Miss Vicky I'm going to Herman and Herman is one of our interventions so they just know what they're doing yeah we couldn't we couldn't do everything we do without them and I do think that it is uh, also really you're going to see the impact of reduced participation in the, the reduced class sizes at preschool for the for the next three years because children who would have participated in a three and a four and a five year old pre K are at the best. Last year the class sizes were reduced by fifty percent and even this year I think almost every day we have someone who's dropping off enrollment packet. So that is pretty normal that you're gonna have kids aging out but this late in the school year to still have vacancies that they're filling. People have just been more reluctant about sending their pre-K children. And so that, that early readiness that you would typically have at least one or two years of preschool, a lot of children are going to school with kindergarten being their first academic rich experience. Let me, so. let me ask this question then. How many other districts have their own pre-K program? Or do any? Significant. Is that something then that this district should look at in the future? I know it's a revenue source. Um, and I, I don't know, I'm just throwing it out. It, it's not something that I would have any aversion to considering. I mean, I operated uh, pre-K and, and zero to three early intervention. But so you're zero. saying a lot of other districts around mm -hmm. us have their own pre-K. And when I was the special ed director at, at Lincoln Elementary School, we operated our own preschools and then a Decatur, Decatur, Make Decatur and Macon Pyatt operated their own. Uh, okay, Carbondale does. Um, Unity Point does. How would that look different than what we have with SIU though? SIU is oh, oh, holy macaroni. You know, SIU's program, the kids are in there like a couple hours at best. And by the time they eat breakfast, eat lunch, go to the bathroom, do all these things, and they're only a half day program. Right. Um, also, what they tell us is they can't ask kids to do anything. They can't say, tell me what this letter is. <clears throat> like they can't, it all has to be exploratory and they can't quiz kids to see what they know or assess what, they can't even make them sit in a chair. They get to pick what station they want to be. Do so, we have any input on the curriculum? No. Yeah. And some of our kids come from SIU, some come from Head Start, some come from, I mean, quite honestly, good programs like at Montessori, St. Andrews, Emmanuel Lutheran that are full day. And not saying that the, they're not, you know, good, like the SIU programs are good programs too, but I mean, we're, we're definitely have, there are some shortcomings to half day programs. The others are programs. just more structured. Well, and I mean, if you go to a, a, a day child attends right. a full day, we transitioned um, to full day pre-K and did two classes with 20 students in each. And, um, the full day was very impactful. I mean, to, to say. It was just a thought. Well, and you see, I mean, unfortunately, there's a bigger gap, too. The kids whose parents have been involved and who are very active to make sure they come to kindergarten knowing their letters and their numbers and their colors are, are a definite, you, you can see them as compared to the other kids who don't even know to sit in their seat, who are still having toileting accidents as far as late, you know, first grade, second grade. You can see definite. The gap is growing, I should say. Any other questions from the board? Thank you, Mrs. Thank Steve. you. Mr. Todd? Looks like, looks like you're gonna be up a couple times here. <laughs> okay, so uh, likewise with Vicky at our school, uh, we benchmark three times a year. We use the star reading product, so it, it assesses math and reading and uh, we do weekly progress monitoring that goes along with that. Um, what you're looking at here is our park score, so I'll just, I'm giving some background information before we go into all the, the different stuff. Um, as far as uh, start three times a year, progress monitoring, math and reading every other week, <coughs> and then we, based on where those students perform on that, we go ahead and uh, start interventions with them. So what you're looking at here is the Illinois Assessment of Readiness. Um, each one of these go 2019, 2021, going up, and they're for each grade level, third, fourth, and fifth. You can tell on this year we didn't have any data because we simply weren't in school to test. 
And each one of these, you can see that it significantly goes down. So from 29, uh, so roughly 30% down to 14%. So that above uh, and meeting, or exceeding, which would be the green and the dark green, um, they significantly dropped from the 2019 to the 2021 school year. Uh, any questions about the Illinois Adjustment Number Days? Um, this would be the ELA portion. Again, you can see uh, drops not quite as much as it was in the mathematics, but we still have some significant drops there. Okay. So the next thing you're going to look at is the star reading. Um, and it is color coded, so on all these charts that you see, color will always be blue on um, the green. And what you're looking at here for third, fourth, and fifth grade is an aggregate average. So for all of our thir uh, third graders, how much reading gain did they make from fall of this year to winter? So you can see that they, on average, they went from a 2.8 reading level to a 3.3 reading level. So the way that these scores show up here, each one of these decimal points here, so what we would consider a hit, is actually a month. So I know that sounds kind of weird, but that's the way the system works. So like a point one would be, 4.6 would be fourth grade, uh, six months into the year. One, 4.9 would be fourth grade, nine months into the year. So they made three months of growth from year to year. So that's your average scores, and then we'll start breaking that down. So this is for reading, we'll go to math. So you can see in math, um, again, they've all, they're all making growth, some more than others, but, but that's exactly what we want to see. So went through and disaggregated that. So what does that mean for our kids? Where are they at overall at the, and where they would be in a previous year? So since COVID, we've seen roughly six months to a year where students are behind, they lag behind that far. This chart here shows for uh, third grade and their reading. Again, uh, blue is the fall, green is the winter. If you just focus on the blue, you can see the like a curve here, like a natural bell curve. Um, and so this is the distribution. This uh, is grade equivalent. So students reading from uh, pre-primer or not able to read at all to 0.9. So there are seven kids. So this is not based on percentage. These are actual, each one of these represents a kid. And so you can see that from the fall to the winter benchmark, uh, four kids transition from here into the next one. And if you look at the green bars, you can see that everything has shifted to the right. So, I mean, what it shows us is that when students are at school, when they're engaged in instruction and um, participating, they're going to make growth. And so um, you can see that, that we've got some kids that are, there are 20 kids that are reading at a first grade level at the beginning of the year, and now we have 16, and they're in first grade. So typically, you know, we'll see some kids down there, but all of this has all shifted to the left. Everybody is six months to a year behind. So in an average year, if you took all this and you shifted it to the right, we would have fewer no kids down there. These typically would be represented by your special education kids, so students who have an IEP, an individualized education plan. And so they can have some profound and significant disabilities that inhibit their ability to be able to read again. So they, they receive specialized instruction from that. So these all these charts and all the data here represents all of our students, so it is not disaggregated. Uh, to separate out our special education students. So, you know, we have three special education classrooms, four, I'd say we got two of them in fourth grade, with anywhere from seven to 12 kids in each one of those classes. And it also includes our REACH class, which is Ashley Ferguson's uh, classroom. So all our SPED members are incorporated. So this would be the third grade math. Again, you can see, like, there's some pretty significant gains happening here. We have 20 kids, now five, 44, 22, 33, 54. So, I mean, they are really moving the needle to get them back on the grade level. So, roughly right now, from third to 3.9, we have 54 students. I mean, if you look up here, we have three kids at a sixth, to sixth grade to seventh grade level, or fifth grade to fifth grade nine months. So, uh, we have several students that are, <coughs> we have to cater to and differentiate our instruction because these kids need totally different instruction from some of these kids down here. So what we have seen is the, the spread has grown. In some, in some cases, it's different. So like here, it's centralized in the middle. In other cases, you'll see like larger groups down here and larger groups up here. And so for each grade level, for each subject, it's like a case by case. So sometimes you have groups on the end, sometimes they're all a tendency in the middle. So <coughs> okay. this would be the fourth grade. 
same thing. This is for reading. Everybody's mentioned good growth. We want to see some of these bars shrink just like they are, and these green bars over here grow. That's good. Here's a fourth grade map. And if you have a question at any point in time, just feel free to ask. Yeah, reading here has changed our map. And so this is really cool. Look at this. There's some kids that are eighth grade to ninth grade on the star reading test up here. And so seventh and eighth grade. Um, at our building, math is definitely a strong point. Um, that shows in our test results. That shows in our students. Um, reading, we're struggling with our reading. And when you start digging, into the data and like, okay, what's literally happening in here? How do we how do we help them? Why are they struggling? That when we went out in the spring and they're gone, and then they were gone last year for you know again eighty percent of the year, sometimes more, uh, depending on the student. Uh, you find that they just weren't engaged in reading. They have lots and lots of screen time. <coughs> they're on YouTube. They're watching videos. They're playing games, but the amount of time that they're spent they're spending engaged in reading, like goes to zero. Few to no minutes with that. So, the more we can have back in school and engage in reading, that's really what's going to help boost up those reading scores. On on back on that other slide, is there those students that are at the seventh and eighth grade level, fifth grade? Mm -hmm. Is will those students be identified for advanced math once they move to the high school or I mean to the junior high? So all those kids, as we send them forward there'll be notes to go forward with them to say, hey, these students are <clears throat> above and beyond. And so, yeah, they will. It'll be interesting to see if those students are the same ones that end up in our honors program. Yeah. Yep. And it should be noted that I, I asked the, the principals to give an abbreviated, any of the principals, if you if you want to take a deeper dig, they're, they're more than like welcoming to sit down and dig deeper into the data. So any anything that you've learned tonight and want to, to dig deeper, like on your math data or on your um, language arts data and the interventions that you're using, whether it's read nationally or... Um, and we can break it down by demographics. So if you wanna see how our English as a second language students, whether there's gender, SES, so socioeconomic status, so kids that are in poverty, uh, stricken neighborhoods, um, so the, all that stuff we can disaggregate and look at where the different performance levels are. In How hard are is it to, to get that data? A uh, couple clicks and a, a little work in a spreadsheet. So, so. I, I personally think that the board would like to see that across all demographics in all the buildings. Um, I'm, speaking for, I'm speaking for my data. Some well, of I, I, some, okay, I just some. I don't want to just make shape her head. Yes, I mean, is that yeah. something that? Yeah, we can all yeah. do that. Are there specific groups that you would No, like I just think just to see it. Okay. So just to see it. I, I, and I like to see, I liked it when it was broken down to previous years too, so you can kind of see that COVID dip. Mm -hmm. um, that was helpful to me to understand, you know, looking at this year's, I see the growth and that's great, but how does that growth compare to previous to years? Three to five years. Yeah. Um, that's, yeah, that's helpful And if you me. look at a three-year cohort, that's that's truly the cohort group and their, their centers, you know, what I'm saying. Like, right. Cycle. Yeah. Is, is it fair to ask? We don't need it tomorrow. No. But but maybe for the for next month packet, just mm -hmm. so that'll give you a month. Sure. Yeah, definitely. I think I think the board would appreciate seeing all of that. Yeah. And I gave very loose directions, just a five minute. No, no, I like that's on fine. your growth data from fall to winter. So. Yeah. Okay, so um, I touched base with uh, Mr. Herndon for about twenty minutes this afternoon. So I don't have as much information about his. Um, I do know that they use the NWEA map, which is uh, an assessment there. They do that three times a year. Um, they've got some benchmarking. That's the benchmarking that they do. Um, and so for each one of these, there are, there are varying um, things that are happening here. Um, some of them are, you know, have went down. Some of them have went up. He wanted me to highlight. So each, this is math scores. There's three different pages here. There's math. There are reading, and then there's a language arts, I believe. Uh, language usage. So in the math score, there's four different areas that that, uh, that touches base on, and I don't have all those written out. But there is uh, operations and algorithmic thinking, uh, statistics, geometry, and one other that escapes my mind at this point in time. 
And so this is an aggregate score of that data. You can see on the left, this is what each one of these is these six grades. So here's his fall data, here's his winter data. This is his seventh grade fall and winter, and this is eighth grade fall and winter. This would be language arts data. And again, it's it's color coded by low, low average, average, high average, and high. And I believe that these the percentages are based on the cohort. So as a test, so if you have a group of 100 students and they break that up, um, so this is based solely on, if I if I'm get it correct, the cohort, the test. So this group of kids would be one cohort, and so there's some cut points in those percentages which determines which one would be a low kid. So a low kid, I don't know the square those are, but the, it could be like anybody that's below a 12%. I think it says low percentage is it 21? 21. Is that right? Yeah, C. In the middle? Oh, there you go. So, yeah, I guess that would be it here. So, 10, 20, 30, 40. No, it's in the side. Yeah, it's in the side. Okay. Oh, here we go. Count low is less than 21%. So, so, you want your students to be in the yellow. Orange, or, sorry, orange, green, or yellow, and those kids that are in the bubble are, that are either on the higher range of the red or the in the average can be those are kind of your bubble kids that you want to move to the, ne the next level up. So one of the things you wanted me to highlight here is they I did see some significant growth in here, so you can see that from 36, uh, these were low performing students, they went down to 23, and you can see 26 stayed the same. So this group absorbed some of those students and you see these other groups and how about some more mm -hmm. so got some significant growth there and language usage in the seventh grade for students. <coughs> and there's one more chart here to drop and this is students at or above grade level. Now this is not based on a percentage, these are uh, actual student numbers. And so you can see that fall is in blue, winter is in red. So some of them, they stay the same. Some of them have went up and down a little bit. As I talked to Mr. Elliott, you know, he mentioned some of them, we have students moving in and out. So they gained a high student or they lost a high student, they gained some low students, vice versa. So some of this would be uh, due to that variation. And the only group in that school who has had at least a four day in person is the sixth grade class. The seventh and eighth grade operated <clears throat> under the AB for for the entire last school year, as well as the March to May in the previous school year. So, when you look at the middle school and the high school data, the the need for growth is just astounding because all, the only six <clears throat> only the sixth grade class had that access to four days in person instruction. The rest were AB or all remote, and, and so, they're the only ones that are pretty much stayed level at add or above everyone else is like that seventh grade class I know so you look at what sixth grade having that opportunity for four days in person gave you more academic stability because again when you're at school and you have access to reading and AR and epic and interventions and all of the things that go on in in-person instruction and just like you said, getting away from your device because there were a lot of students who did the A, B, and then those other days they were watching TV, working, you know, sleeping, playing video games. They were not doing academic rich things. So, so the sixth grade is the only group that had that four day stability last year in, in these next two groups that you'll see. Does, does the testing of the middle school change? Because it seems like the, you know, the previous two schools you'd look at you know, fall to winter is a significant increase. Is it because those grades are just like you're testing a third grader at a certain level in the fall in the exact same, you know, caliber test in the, in the winter, and they're able to show progression where this one is getting progressively harder as the year goes on well, to no. show at or above? So that's one of the things that uh, Mr. Sunny and I were talking about with the NWA math, and I believe, I'm not 100% certain, so, uh, but I want to say that the cut 
uh, score, so where those scores are for each test for your fall, your winter, and your spring, each time they step up. So as you're not going to see the significant that. increase like you would on Ames. Ames right. And you win these because. And we have three different benchmarking tools, yeah. and that is, that is one thing Fair. that we're working on. We're working on getting a tool, a K to eight tool, so the apples to apples. apples to apples, because right now, but if you go to a parent teacher conference, you're going to look. And you have a, a second grader, a fourth grader, and a eighth grader. You're going to have three different tools that you're going to be looking at: RIT scores and NPRs, and and it just gets the data. Well, gets you just get used it. to it, and then they change schools, and you get another one. So mm -hmm. we're looking at a consistent benchmarking tool, so that when you look at data next year, the the fall, winter, and spring for your benchmarking will be consistent. That, that's what your goal is: is to have a new. The, there's pilot groups right now who have tested some of the. Okay. The different tools and so the goal will be a k to eight we will not change uh, the high school high, yep the high school will continue to use college board which is, <laughs> is what we will prepare them for the sat but um k to eight will have a consistent benchmarking tool some of the other things that mr hernan asked me this year was that you know they've adjusted pacing they've got rpi groups that they put into place to help kids that are struggling with differentiation going on within the classroom and they're looking at tutoring before and after school so hopefully maybe take advantage of some of that carries funding All right, thank you, Mr. Todd. Mr. Elmeyer. Good evening. So with the high school, obviously, there's a, some different focal points to look at um, in that our, our main goal at the end of high school is to graduate and for students either be prepared for college, for the military, or for a career, or vocational the trades, OK? Uh, with that being said, I wanted to look at graduation rates. I wanted to look at ninth grade on track to graduate rates as well as our SAT scores in ELA, SAT scores in math, and usually we would use the Illinois Science Assessment as a benchmark to see where our students are performing uh, in science, but there's no data. They have not scored those tests the last two years, so we don't have that data. So if we want to look at graduation rates, um, 2016, we're at 79% graduation rate. State average is 85.5. 17, 84.5 to 87. State average, 18, 79.9 to 86.2. 19, 81.6 to 86.2 state average. 2020 was our first uh, time since I've been in Murfreesboro School District that we uh, had a higher graduation rate than the state average at 89.3 when the state was at 88%. Um, that had been a very big goal of ours for quite some time and we wanted to achieve it within five years uh, and we achieved it much earlier, I think, in year three of that goal being set in our school improvement plans from years past. However, when you look at last year, uh, May of 2021's graduation rate, it dropped to 74.5%, where the state's uh, average only dropped to 86%. Um, and looking at that data point, I think that goes back to kind of our, um, our vision and our mission. Uh, and do we change our expectations in order to keep that number high and I think we chose to still hold students accountable there and, and I think that number reflects that um, where other districts in our area I mean I'm aware of you know 40% curves on kids grades during that COVID year to uh, to allow their graduation rates to, to remain high we didn't do those types of things uh, we, we continued to hold kids accountable and um, Yes, Since, I would agree with that. But, uh, we all, but we also, I think, as a district at whole, we were also very forgiving of kids. That we were. were. They gave the effort. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and with that being said, you know, we'll talk about our credit recovery program and some things that have happened there here in just a little bit as well uh, with that graduation rate. Freshman on track, again, uh, 2017, 89%. And just explain what freshman on track means. In order to be a freshman on track at the end of your freshman year, you have to have passed five credit hours of coursework. You had to have five credits out of your transcript out of a possible seven in MHS. And you can only fail one core class, math, reading, social studies, and science, or, or reading in English. So if you, if you have five credits and you pass three of those four core classes, you would be considered a ninth grade on track by the Illinois State Board of Education, okay? Uh, 2017. Our freshmen, we had 89% on track, state average was 87, 
Uh, this year we had a major data entry situation with our with our power school program. We had just kind of switched to power school at that time too, and so so that one wasn't wasn't right. And and we Steve did a lot of contacting with SB and I, and we finally got the data entry right the next year, and we went to eighty two percent with a state average of eighty seven percent, eighty six percent with a state average of eighty nine percent, and then. This past year, we went to 68% on track to graduate. So our current sophomores going into the sophomore school year, only 68% of them are on track to graduate, okay? With the state average being at 82%. And it dropped much more significantly than graduation rates did uh, that year for the state average. So again, another alarming uh, statistic that, I mean, we're really gonna have to focus in on our sophomores right now over the next two and a half years to be sure that we get those students on track to graduate which is doable, uh, it really is. Can they do credit recovery to get that? Yes, yeah, we'll be talking about, I'll talk about that. I was gonna say, there's some inter interventions there's, we There's definite interventions that I wanna talk about once we get through the data of where we're at. SAT scores in English language arts, this is our junior classes tested with the SAT in the spring of their junior year. So this data point right here is from our juniors last year, our seniors right now, in April, okay? Um, the state did not release SAT data during our full COVID year last year. Uh, but as you can see in English, 2017, we were at 29%, 29%, then 18, and 19, we grew to 31%. I feel like we are just along with the graduation rate and freshman on track, how things were growing until COVID hits, and then we've fallen down to 19%, meeting or exceeding on the SAT test, okay? And then math, uh, we have been significantly dropping every year. Um, and I think our curriculum adoption this past year was a very good thing uh, for that. You know, uh, hiring Mrs. Sunny was also a very good thing for that, uh, being a math guru. And uh, I think we're gonna see a lot of growth there as well. But right now we're at 15% meeting or exceeding on the math test. I do wanna kinda talk about fall PSAT scores, because with College Board, what we do is junior year, you take the SAT. Your sophomore and freshman year in the spring on SAT day, they take the PSAT. Now in the fall, and that's in the spring in April, the fall, junior, freshmen, sophomores, and juniors all take the PSAT. So we kind of have two data points. We only have one of our data points right now from the fall, but then we'll have another data point from the spring when they test in the spring. We don't have a winter data point. College Board, we, we don't do a, a, a PSAT test during the winter. Now, with that being said, the fall of 2021, our, S, our uh, current juniors who will be taking the SAT in the spring, in April, their score this fall was 897. Their score last fall was 867 as sophomores. <clears throat> our current sophomores, this fall, their score was 831, and their score as freshmen were 790, was 798. So there is growth. It's not as much growth as we would like to see, but even given the, the pandemic and the uh, loss of learning, there, there is some growth there as well. So some intervention strategies that we're working on to try to improve this learning loss and attack this. Uh, summer school, we had summer school this past year, uh, and, and we're going to have it continuing uh, this summer as well. Last summer, there were 30 credits recovered, and we had two students who did not graduate graduate the, this past summer. Um, so that would take your 74.5% average probably up to almost 76, 77% just with those two students. We've also, in the fall, had two more seniors graduate as well. So we've had students graduate to help that, but it doesn't get to go on the Illinois Report Card to show as an improvement in your graduation rate, because that cohort's lost it's out gone. there somewhere. It's it gone. Go, it doesn't go on any year at all? I don't think it'll go on this year as well, either. Really? Because they're seen as a cohort from last year. Yep. We get to count it in our number, but not our percentage. And we don't have, it, they don't count as dropouts or, you know, exits to right. run out in places like that. So yep. it is still the right, you know, direction to move in to say yep. every child who starts in Murfreesboro High School deserves to graduate. And we'll make sure that they have the tools and the supports to get there. And, and there were kids that without the sports and a full digital or an A B schedule were not successful last year. They could, they were not independent. I mean, the most they could access in person was forty percent of their their daily, you know. And I mean, if, if if you guys could take five minutes and speak with Mrs. Sunny as far as attendance and truancy over the past year and a half, 
um, it's rampant. I mean, there's, there's, there's students that we tried to get in contact with them and their parents the entire year, and there's students we never saw. And then there was no contact. I mean, it, it, it was, it was that, a very disheartening year in the front office trying like to they've get they've just people. gotten so far behind that there's no hope and that... I think, and I think there's also parents out there that did not value it. Right. And I think that Friday the 13th of 2020 narrative that, you know, that first three months where it was like, you'll still, you'll still get grades, right? You'll still pass. Right. Some had yeah. that lingering hope that there was going to be that magic panacea at the end and be like, oh, we're just kidding. Even though you only did 12% of your work, you're, no, like last year, if you, if you didn't do the work, you know, and I mean, our teachers were rock stars about using their, their Chrome to post assignments, to give links. But if a student is not, a, not an independent learner, they were not accessing the tools that were available for them to be successful, you know, synchronously and asynchronously. So and, and I do have to say that I think Mrs. Sunny would say this too, in talking with some of our kids, when they come into high school, it's the first time that they think, I don't know if they think we're serious when they tell them, oh no, if you don't pass English 9, you, you don't graduate. Mm -hmm. You're gonna have, if you don't pass your freshman, you're gonna have to take your sophomore year with two English sections. Mm -hmm. Or you're not going to graduate in your third year, your fourth year. They don't. They don't realize how serious it is that you have to pass four years of English. You have to pass three years of math, two years of science, uh, or you do not graduate. They, I, it just it, it takes them a hard. It takes them a long time to understand that that is serious and that, and there's, that we can't just hand them a diploma at the end. And, and the impact's hard on teachers too. I remember just this past Thursday when I was having a conversation with an eighth grade teacher. This is his third year. He has yet to have a normal school year. It was interrupted in March, he was AB last year, and now he's five day in person. That's a first year teacher. And so, you know, supporting and valuing where each of our people that matter, our adults, our children, and getting them to, to where they need to be so that they're on track for their goals is, is just the biggest deal we have. It is. Um, one great part, the credit recovery program that we created this past year with Ms. Burr. I have to say Ms. Burr has done a perfect job. I mean, I can't say it any better than she's done a perfect job. Uh, this is now, I put that in on last Thursday. It is now 154 courses have been recovered in credit recovery. Okay, when, when you say that, how many students is that? Uh, at, at any certain time, we have 15 or 16 kids in that program. So if you Whoa. were to look at, oh, let it recognize my face. So that's almost 10 credit hours per student? Correct. So they are, wow. so they, I mean, there, there are some kids that, there are some students that we have taken out of there at Christmas time because now they're back on track to graduate. There were probably, what, six or seven kids out of the 15 that we took out of there and said, okay, now you're back with your cohort, with your class, because you're on track to graduate now. Mm -hmm. uh, you were also responsive to the students who said, this is a better system for me. And correct. Let's, let's, there were some students who said, this works for me. There, there are some that were fearful to go back out into the regular setting mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. felt they might go fall back behind and not graduate this spring. And so we continued to have them in there. And so with that being said, there were six or seven or eight that we kept in there, and then we added six or seven new in January to join the program. Well, and as soon as they and as soon as they get caught up, we're gonna remove and them. If and if you see Ms. Burr, I mean, you, she <clears throat> is just so passionate about her students and their success. It's just it's crazy. She has a very good teacher. balance of, of of being positive and having the energy to get them motivated, but at the same time being hard enough on them that it doesn't break them. Like, because I mean, I mean, honestly, a lot of those kids in that class, they felt like it was hopelessness. They weren't going to be able to graduate. They're 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 a year behind on graduation. And now you see those kids acting totally different in our school. That hey, I'm going to get to graduate now. So so this has been a very good thing, and I think it will continue to be a very good thing for us. I think it's something that we need to uh, prioritize keeping for quite some time. And 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 if it's beneficial, maybe a for a forever. That's a forever. That this will be a forever unless we see some type of plateau that I don't think we will. Right. Know. There's always going to be a kid, kid who needs more support. And and it's, and it's finding the balance. Uh, myself, Miss Hickam, Mrs. Sunny, Mrs. Geis, Miss Renfro, and and Miss Burr. We sit down and we have co real conversations. Is this kid really going to work in here? Because mm -hmm. if not, we don't want to ruin the environment in there. You know what I mean? And, and so we have very, very real conversations about once a quarter about the progress of that program to, to make sure that it's still doing this right here. With the, in the 79 to 84% graduation rate, if this had been in place for the last you know, 10 years, right. 
we would probably be about the state average every year. I mean, one of the things I hate more than anything about my job is when I have to sign a drop slip mm -hmm. for a kid to drop out and most likely go to rebound and then graduate with a Carbondale diploma at rebound. Mm -hmm. Because let's face it, Carbondale requires 19 credits. We require 24. So a kid that's a half a year behind on graduation for us could essentially drop and go to rebound and graduate on time or ahead of time. We've had kids graduate ahead of time with those 19 credits. Kids in my class do that very they, they graduate ahead of time because they know that they have enough credits over there, but not here. So my, my I hope this prevents me from having to sign drop slips to go over that. I really do. Um, the next thing we did, uh, adopted Big Ideas math curriculum. Uh, a year early last year, it's being uh, uh, implemented right now by all math teachers at the high school with Fidelity. They've done a great job with it. Uh, if you don't know the math department at the high school, they're a worker bees. They really work hard, and, and so they, they got together with Mrs. Sunny last year and really put their brains together on what type of curriculum they'd like to see. We have went back to traditional math with Algebra 1, Geometry, Algebra 2, instead of Integrated Math 1, 2, and 3. Um, and we have an actual curriculum with an actual textbook now with our students. So, uh, I, I and, and uh, the middle school next year will be uh, fully implemented as well. And so I think we'll see some continuity, six through 12, where we have standards-based uh, learning with that curriculum uh, year after year. I'm sure parents helping students at home thank you as well. It's that, yeah, I mean, there, there was a lot of complaints. I mean, there were a lot of complaints about that. that. was one of the big complaints in the past was that there was no textbook for parents to be able to help their kids. And so, yeah, yeah I agree. Trying to figure out a calculus problem the way I did it I versus the way they were supposed to right. do it. Just like... Correct. Um, we've also increased the number of math teachers by 25. Uh, when Mr. Manwaring moved into helping and being half-time tech with Mr. Carrington, uh, that helped us uh, hire Mr. Moore. And so by doing that, you're decreasing the amount of students per class in math. Uh, so there's more one-on-one -on -one time with the teacher with each student. And so I, I hope that helps as well. We're pouring a lot of energy into math. And we really are, and, and we need to, and we should. Um, and then we've now uh, targeted in our ELP class, the last period of the day, we've targeted students who are tar uh, that are close to meeting or exceeding on the SAT. In other words, what we would consider a bubble student. They're very close to meeting or exceeding on the ACT. And so we have placed them in ELPs with our math teachers during ELP to work on interventions and get ready for that test. So hopefully we move those kids that are just under meeting up into meeting or exceeding to help those numbers. And I mean, if you if you look back at 15% at meeting and exceeding, you get five kids in a grade level out from being just under meeting to meeting, and that's a big percentage move. That's a big percentage move. When you're talking 120 kids in a grade level, you're talking 10 to 15% right there, bam. They went from 15 to 25% meeting exceeding that quick if we can get some of those bubble students to buy in and do that. Um, and then uh, we do have future planning for ELP sections for English language arts as well, interventions. Um, and then we have, uh, we're have we gonna be setting up a SAT prep unit for math and ELA. Uh, the month leading up to the April SAT test. Uh, Princeton Review, being a gear up school, has given us free access for each student to the Princeton Review uh, SAT prep course. And we're about to start rolling that out with uh, Celeste, our gear up uh, employee, and start getting that out to teachers for students to use during ELP as well. Um, and no, too, I, I, I am a firm believer in the SAT is very important. Being ready for college is very important, but we also have students that aren't college bound. And they don't want to be college men. And and that's okay. You know, I, I what concerns me the most is graduation. I want to be sure that a kid has earned a diploma so they can have that choice to either go to college or go into the military or get a job. You know, and, and so we've got to get that graduation rate back up. That's 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 the most important on my list immediately. So. All right. Any questions for Mr. Eleanor? All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And I, I think on behalf of the board when we come to these meetings and, and we're approving bids for HVAC and buildings and etc I think this is the stuff that everybody sitting at this table is is the reason that we ran to get on the board to hear about the education of our future so to Dr. Evers the administration to the entire teaching staff 
just want to say on behalf of the board, thank you for what you are doing for our kids. And I, you, you have faced so many obstacles in the past two years. It's unbelievable. But you've taken the bull by the horns and have not let that deter you from making sure that our kids need to be where they're at, get, get to where they need to be. So thank you for that. Thank you all. Okay. Um, next item under new business is the approval of the K-5 math curriculum which is enclosure number two in your packet. Are there any questions from the board? Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion to approve the adoption <coughs> of the curriculum. So moved. A second. Mrs. Hines? Mrs. Evaldi? Yes. Mr. Beavers? Yes. Mrs. Brazel? Yes. Mr. Green? Yes. Mr. Brown? Yes. Mr. Bame? Yes. Mr. Runge? Yes, motion carries. Item number three is the approval of the resolution abating the taxes heretofore levied for the year 2021 to pay debt service on the general obligation school bonds, the alternate revenue source, series 2017 general obligation school bonds, alternative revenue source, series 2019, and general obligation school bonds, series 2020, for the district and the best way that I can describe this to the board here and, and all the people that are here and anybody watching is basically the board has two choices with this abatement. Uh, there's roughly $161,000 that we would be abating and what our choices are is because of the county facility sales tax, That's we would use that to you. That's not this. I know, I know, I know. We have to abate, we have to approve the abating first and then we'll get to the amount. On these bonds. Correct. This is a new project. This is the old bonds, 161 pounds. On number two. All right, so just forget the 161 pounds. Right. That's what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. All right. So just take just forget I said 161 thousand dollars. But the choice is to use the county facility sales tax. So in other words, anybody coming into Jackson County and buying anything will be helping to pay for those for this. Or the board has the choice of putting this amount onto the property owners of Murfreesboro. Right, and on these bonds, these three bonds, when we um, sold the bonds to finance the projects, that was the intent that the county facility sales tax was paid for these bonds. And these were the new ones. Like and, and there's just a turf and Yeah, they call these backup so then if if the county facility sales tax wouldn't be available to pay for these bonds then we could levy that and ask the taxpayers to so it's really housekeeping um when these bonds were sold this was that was the intent but you still do have to pass this resolution on the three bonds to abate in order for it to go on the county facility sales tax any questions from the board on that that's first round was the project was done with the turf and the mm -hmm. Auditorium. Auditorium and the turf. So yes vote is to let the county facility sales tax pay for it. A no vote would be to let the property owners of Murfreesboro pay for it. So I'll entertain a motion to approve the abatement. So, second. Mrs. Hines. Mr. Beavers. Yes. Mr. Brown. Yes. Mr. Green. Yes. Mrs. Evaldi. Yes. Mr. Bain. Yes. Mrs. Brazel. Yes. Mr. Green. Mr. Rungy. Yes, motion carries. All right, item number four is the approval of the resolution transferring funds, funds from the school facility occupation tax fund of CUSD 186 Jackson County, Illinois to the bond and interest fund of said school district and abating the taxes heretofore levied for the year 2021 to pay debt service on the taxable general obligation limited school bond series 2009A of the district. Questions from the board? There's your 161,000. This is the 161,000, the specific this, amount. This is the one that's the older bond that we can use the county facility sales tax instead of property tax. Instead of the property right. owners. And this is the last time because after this, um, it's paid off. the bonds will be paid off next next fiscal year. So this gotcha. is the last time that this question will come to the board on this bond. Any other questions for the board? 
I'll entertain a motion to approve this one, this resolution. So moved. Second. 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 Mrs. Hines? Mr. Beavers? Yes. Mr. Brown? Yes. Mrs. Evaldi? Yes. Mr. Bain? Yes. Mrs. Brassel? Yes. Mr. Green? Yes. Mr. Riney? Yes, motion carries. Item number five is the school calendar. This is informational only. And Mrs. Brazel and Mr. Brown have volunteered to represent the board on um, that particular meeting that you have to set the school calendar. So there you go, the two people from the board that will help you. Item number six is to set the class of 2022 graduation and baccalaureate date and time, which is to be May the 28th, 2022 at 7.30. That's the graduation. Baccalaureate would be held on the same day at 11 a.m. Are there any questions from the board? Then I'll entertain a motion to, to approve setting of the graduation and baccalaureate dates. So moved. And a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries, and we have a need to go, um, yeah, we have a need to go into closed session. Make a motion. Can I ask one question real quick? Absolutely. On the graduation day, is that just for the seniors getting out? Is everybody going to get out at the same time? As far as school? Yes. yes. All no, students as far as all this, the district. All students will be out at the same time. Yes. They'll all be out at the same seniors time. Seniors do know not get out earlier. earlier. Pardon me? He said Sen they would all be out at the same time. Okay. Thanks. All right. We needed to go into closed session. Before we motion to go into closed session, is there any additional closed session topics that we need to cover that you want in addition to these to discuss? I think he's got them all. Okay. I just, we've gone in before and yeah. it's like, can we talk about this? We have to say no. So, okay. I think he's got everything. Make a motion to go into closed session pursuant to section two of the Open Meetings Act 5 on our compiled statutes 120-2C to review the appointment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, or dismissal of specific employees of the district, including hearing testimony on a complaint lodged against an employee to determine its validity. And number two, collective negotiating matters between the public body and its employees or their representatives or deliberations concerning salary schedules for one or more classes of employees. And number three, a student disciplinary case. And a second? Second. Mrs. Hines? Mr. Beavers? Yes. Mrs. Evaldi? Yes. Mr. Bain? Yes. Mrs. Bra Brazel? Yes. Mr. Green? Yes. Mr. Brown? Yes. Mr. Rungy? Yes, motion carries. Let's take 